Well, look, let's just get right into it. Um, free trade, a good thing or a bad thing for Australia? Um, what's your view? What's your party's view? Yeah, our free trade is voluntary exchange between uh, a willing seller and a willing buyer. Um, and in, in, in this context, it's referring to international buyers and sellers. Um, but uh, all trade is good. Uh, you don't trade with anybody, you don't sell something, you don't buy something unless you think it's in your interests. Um, so you've got mutual interest, a buyer and a seller, it's all voluntary, there's nothing coerced about it, it's a good thing. So, um, you know, keep your nose out of uh, uh, something which is uh, other people's uh, business, in my view, is, uh, is a good rule to follow. So that means free trade. So, so fundamentally the LDP have that sort of position as really coming from a, a consistency with libertarian values, I take it? Yes, that's right. The Liberal Democrats is, is based on libertarian values. Uh, so our view is um, we, we need a government but only for a limited number of things. And uh, that certainly doesn't include uh, messing around in, in the trade area. We need biosecurity uh, to keep out nasty diseases and you need a court system to uh, go to when, if somebody tries to cheat you or um, rob you or something like that, for example. But, you know, those, those sort of things aside, the government should basically keep its nose out of uh, uh, our business. We should sell to whoever we like, we should buy from whoever we like. Um, and, uh, as I said, subject to a few small uh, rules, it's really none of the government's business. And that, that's what free trade is all about. It's not compulsory, it's voluntary, um, and uh, it's between con consenting people. David, what do you say to the loud voices at times who oppose free trade? And in your view, what are the, the benefits of actually having free trade? Well, the big benefit of free trade is prosperity. Um, we've had this argument about free trade for centuries. It's not really a new debate. It comes and goes in cycles. Um, and uh, we can look back through history and say, OK, those communities, those countries, those organisations that uh, fostered free trade, encouraged free trade, they prospered. Those that became protectionist said, no, we don't like... Uh, uh, we don't like um, dealing with these people, we don't want to buy your, your products, we want to protect our local uh, producers, for example, uh, they don't prosper anywhere near as much. And there's lots and lots of examples, there's even modern examples. Um, uh, Indonesia, for example, every now and then goes through a period of saying, well, we don't want to import various goods, we want to produce them ourselves. And, w and even beef, for example, they don't want to import our cattle uh, from time to time, so they stop uh, bring them in, say, well, we're going to grow them all ourselves. As a result, the price of beef goes right up in Indonesia. They can't afford to, uh, to eat beef, so they're not getting a, the, the diet that they'd like. And Australian cattle producers uh, don't sell their cattle to Indonesia. So as a result, both sides lose. When they drop that, that uh, approach, Australian cattle producers obviously sell more cattle to Indonesia. Uh, uh, consumers of beef in Indonesia uh, benefit by having affordable, good quality beef. Now that's just one small example. When you multiply that thousands and thousands of times, what you end up with is a prosperous society. Through, uh, well, centuries, as I said before, um, there are uh, innumerable examples of where free trade has led to prosperity. Restrictions on free trade have diminished prosperity and sometimes led to poverty. Cuba and Venezuela are, are more recent examples. Yeah. David, some industries though, like manufacturing for example, are opened up to uh, very effective, if you like, competitors from around the world. How should the manufacturing industry respond? I mean, I get it about agriculture and so on, that's, a, that's an open and cut shot, that's an absolute clear case. But what about manufacturing? Yeah, look, um, you can't argue that free trade is uh, good for everyone. There are always going to be some losers. I mean, you know, going way back, you know, the farriers who are putting uh, shoes on horses is the old, the old example. They lost out because we didn't need horses anymore. Um, when refrigerators were invented, uh, the people who were making ice and selling ice, they lost out. There's always losers from, uh, uh, from change and from trade and so forth. So in manufacturing, there are winners because uh, they become more innovative, 
they become more, uh, more competitive, they think of ways to do things that the rest of the world's not doing, and they sell things, and we, we have good examples of that. We sell catamarans, big catamarans we produce in Western Australia as a good example of selling them all over the world. We have the cochlear implant for deaf people which we're selling all over the world. But there's lots of things we can't make that are competi on a competitive basis. We just have to accept that. And the other thing is a lot of, a lot of uh, manufacturers that are imported are in fact inputs to other businesses. So uh, building materials is a good example and you quite often hear people, local manufacturers say, well I can't import, uh, I can't compete with imported uh, building materials and it's putting me out of business, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to suffer. Except that those building materials are used by builders to, to construct um, buildings, obviously. Using imported ones, which are cheaper, are, uh, uh, that lowers the cost of uh, the overall construction, so our building costs uh, are kept down. Now, that's tough on that manufacturer, but overall, uh, the economy benefits. And uh, if you go propping up um, every, every manufacturer says, I can't compete with an import, you end up still with horses and still using ice instead of refrigerators. Um, David, what do you make then of this sort of, I think, growing voice? I mean, that's my take, I think Peter's take on it too, a growing voice or a chorus of voices around Australia now talking about sort of, um, you know, fair trade, not free trade, and, and starting to really sell, sell a sort of a message that somehow Australia is, is crazy to, to be so much into, into to free trade and free trade agreements. What do, what do you make of that? Well, the argument about fair trade is always, well, whose definition of fair uh, do you accept? Her, what's fair to you might not be fair to me. And uh, my view of fair is, well, if, if you're happy with the deal and the other guys are happy with the deal, then that's fair. Um, but other people say, oh, no, you, you can't have that. So you need some sort of arbiter. It always ends up being the government, um, public servants, politicians, deciding what's fair for people and they've got no skin in the game. It doesn't improve thing at all, anything at all. The, um, you know, your question though is, well, you know, why, is there, why are there calls for fair trade rather than free trade? It's because there's sympathy for the people who miss out um, uh, with free trade and there, as I said, it's not it's not always good for everybody, although overall it is good for everybody, but not at all the time at, at, for every single person. So uh, there's some sympathy for those people. So it's usually coming from those, those quarters that this uh, argument against fair trade arises. It also comes in cycles. You know, these, I'm old enough to remember um, this argument having come around several times in my lifetime, free trade versus uh, fair trade or free trade um, you know, we, we'll only sell our products to so-and-so if they buy uh, ours. You know, how ridiculous is that? You know, we're going to keep them for ourselves to uh, and not sell them to everybody and let them sit on the shelves here or we'll not make them in the first place because somebody else uh, is, wants to sell us products. It, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of illogical um, mm. uh, thinking behind it. David, one of the reasons uh, Cam and I wanted to do this show on fair trade is because we have sensed there's an increasing number of voices, if you like, opposing free trade. Do you get that same sense? And if you do, why do you think that is? I'm not sure that there's a lot more, but these things do come in cycles. Uh -huh. And I'm fairly, I'm fairly sure that, uh, I mean, I can think of times when we were way, way more protectionist than we are now. Um, we are relatively, relatively a free trade uh, country now, although we go through periods of self-doubt. Um, I think it's probably a, a consequence of prosperity due to free trade, largely, and then forgetting how we got there, be how we became prosper uh, prosperous. So we, we tend to take it for granted that uh, free trade got us there, and then we start worrying about the relatively small number of people who, who haven't benefited from it because they, they haven't adapted, they haven't become innovative, they haven't driven their costs down or something like that. There is a practical uh, uh, way you can help those people, of course, other than for, uh, to go for a protectionist approach, and that is to look at why aren't those manufacturers who are struggling to compete with imports, why are they uncompetitive? And you'll often find that it's due to the government 
either regulating too much with too much red, red tape or taxing them too much. And of course that opens up the whole question about company taxes. But, uh, but it could easily be that those, those manufacturers could be more competitive um, if the taxes they paid were lower and the red tape they faced was uh, less restrictive. We'll have to get you back on to talk about red tape, that's for sure. I'm sure what you and I would be <laughs> birds of a feather on that one. But can we now get to yeah. sort of the pointy end? Um, we just had the Minister on talking about uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Do you want to make some commentary on that and your, your views on where that's yeah. going and, and, and how you would view it if it sort of ultimately uh, comes before you know, the Senate for, for ratification? Yeah, yeah sure. Overall, it's a very good, uh, it's a very good idea. Multiple, multiple countries in, a, in a, a free trade agreement, broadly a free trade agreement, is always a good thing. Bilateral free trade agreements like we have with America and half a dozen countries, uh, they're all good, but multi, multilateral ones are better. Even better would be to have uh, overall r removal of uh, trade barriers, but uh, that's, a, that's a way off. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a good deal. It'll certainly help our, our exporters substantially. They will have market access um, uh, on, a, on a better basis with either lower or no tariffs in many, many cases. Um, there's only a couple of aspects about the old TPP that I didn't like. One was the intellectual property components and they've been parked apparently um, as a result of America's withdrawal from it, from President Trump's decision not to proceed. So, you know, I'm not too distressed about that. Um, and uh, um, there was another, another aspect to it also that I wasn't too happy with. One of the things that I do like about it, uh, which, which you'll find the Greens complaining about and various other odds and sods, is this dispute resolution um, mm. element in it. Um, some people say that's bad. You know, I think they've got they've got that completely wrong. If, uh, if, a, if, if a, a country or a, a, an exporter from another country is selling stuff to, into Australia and the Australian uh, company uh, duds them, you know, says I'm not going to pay you, you know, uh, they're not gonna, I'm, I'm not going to live up to the contract or anything like that. Of course that, that country or that, that company that's selling stuff to Australia can go to an Australian court and the Australian court says, no, that contract is valid, you have to abide by that. Now, not every, other, not every country that we sell to has that, that uh, clear path to resolve a contract uh, dispute. So if we had a, an argument with, a, uh, with a, a, a company in another country that was buying our goods, and they said, no, we're not going to pay you, you can go and whistle for your money, and uh, we've changed the rules and too bad you didn't like it. Um, it, there in, in some countries, there is no court system equivalent to ours in which we can go to. So what the TPP contract or uh, treaty provides for is a mechanism for that to be resolved. So you have this independent arbiter, and if the arbiter says, no, you've got to keep to your contract, that's it. And, and, uh, and so the country signs up to that, and it doesn't really matter uh, whether you think their court system is good, bad or indifferent, you still have a way to s resolve that dispute. That's going to be really good for Australian exporters. It's a good thing to have in a, in a deal like this and uh, I think it should be praised, not criticised. David, unfortunately we're nearly out of time, but can I ask you one other thing? Now that the uh, mm. company tax is being dropped in the United States, if that happens elsewhere, if we have a higher company tax rate, is that going to disadvantage us when it comes to free trade? Yes, it is. What it means is that uh, uh, companies that do business in Australia will be handing over more of their profits to uh, the government than uh, uh, companies in, say, the United States, which might be trying to compete with our Australian companies. So a company might be, let's go back to the building products uh, argument, a company in America might be producing building products and wanting to export them to Australia and sell them. Uh, they would pay 21% uh, tax on their profit in America. An Australian company might be wanting to sell those same building products in competition to that American uh, company for a profit. They would be selling, uh, they would be making uh, a profit hopefully and they would pay 30% on that. So if it then became a question of well who can drive their costs down uh, with more investment, who can become more innovative, use perhaps more computers and and uh, you know, high-tech equipment or whatever, 
the one that's got more money left over after paying their tax is more likely to do that and that'll be the American company because it didn't give us, hand as, as much of its profits over to the company, uh, to the government. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a very obvious thing. We have to lower our company taxes if we want our companies to remain competitive. David, uh, that's a, a great point. And I also really liked uh, your points about, for example, the cochlear ear implants, uh, the export of those, uh, the, um, the catamarans. I'll give you another one company called Ferro Engineering in suburban Brisbane exports uh, parts that are used in the aer aerospace industry for companies like Boeing. So again, it's, as you were saying, uh, things that are then manufactured in, into some other uh, good, ultimately, like, like an aeroplane. But look, thank you so yeah. much for coming on this evening. We Thanks, have David. to get you on in the future to talk red tape, I think. I think that'll be a very, <laughs> okay. very interesting discussion. Good. Thank you very much for having me. All the best, David.